Good morning. Um, a teacher of mine once described my style as uh, quite languorous. And as a consequence, since I want to get to the end of my story and give you some opportunity to ask questions, um, I will get started. Uh, I'm also told I am supposed to introduce myself. Um, there's a real moral hazard problem there. I could make up all sorts of really cool things. About me, I will instead keep it short and tell you that I am Robert Strassfeld. I have been teaching at the law school at Case Western since 1988. Uh, I wear a lot of hats there, including uh, directing something called the Institute for Global Security Law and Policy. Uh, but I also um, uh, am a legal historian. Uh, and as a legal historian, I like to tell stories, and that is mostly what I am going to do today, tell you a story about Cleveland long ago. Uh, however, uh, because the, um, uh, the um, powers that be would uh, like there to be something contemporary about this talk for purposes of conferring CLE credit. Um, and because I think it, uh, there is reason to talk about today as well, um, I will eventually uh, have something to say about um, not only today, but perhaps um, what things look like in the near, uh, in the near term. Uh, I assume these microphones are, I mean, it's a small enough room even without. Okay. Um, so, uh, like so many good stories, my story starts in a bar. Um, or, uh, more specifically, with a bartender, a person named George Phibbs, uh, who was tending bar in Cleveland in the mid-1870s. Uh, but Phibbs was a, an ambitious young man who thought he could do better than a life as a bartender. Uh, and he figured he would um, pursue a career in law. Uh, so he found a mentor. He found somebody um, with whom he could apprentice. Uh, he became a law clerk to Cleveland lawyer John P. Green. Now. Phibbs was a clever young man, and uh, Green was a very sensible choice uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, Green wasn't all that much older than Phibbs. He had um, entered the profession in 1870, um, and Phibbs may have thought that Green would be a sympathetic and congenial mentor. But even though Green was a recently minted lawyer, he was somebody whose star was ascending. In 1873, he had been elected uh, as a justice of the peace and had narrowly, subsequently had narrowly failed to win a seat in the Ohio General Assembly. Um, Phibbs may have been aware that there was talk of Green making another run for the General Assembly, which he would eventually do and get elected in 1882. Um, and in the 1890s, he served a uh, term as a state senator. Uh, Green's career was very much uh, tied in with the um, Republican Party. Uh, amongst his mentors was Senator Mark Hanna. And when McKinley was elected president, um, Green managed to um, arrange for a uh, position for himself as superintendent of the stamp division of the Postmaster General's office in Washington. Now, the story of a young, ambitious man seeking fortune and success by attaching himself to someone more established is hardly novel. But there is an interesting aspect to this story, and that's that Phibbs was an Irish-American immigrant, and Green, a transplanted North Carolinian, was uh, Cleveland's first African-American lawyer. This uh, of the 
uh, <clears throat> impressive mustache is uh, John P. Green. Um, their professional relationship lasted approximately 10 years, during which time Phibbs gained admission to the bar and became uh, Green's partner. Green attributed much of his political and professional success in the Cleveland Irish community to his association with Phibbs. Um, and he described Phibbs as his best friend outside of his family. Phibbs, incidentally, eventually goes on to Southern California, where he works uh, both as a private lawyer and also a prosecutor, um, becomes involved in civil rights litigation on behalf of Chinese Americans, um, and eventually makes his fortune in the breakfast cereal business. Um, from the vantage point of over a century, the arrangement between Green and Fibs may seem surprising. The lucky coincidence of two unusual men who were able to see beyond um, whatever prejudices they had been raised with to cross racial boundaries. But that's um, their story, while um, certainly unusual, is not unique. Indeed, theirs was not the first interracial law practice in Cleveland. Several years earlier, the, their um, partnership begins in the late 1870s. Several years earlier, Leon Wilson, who was Cleveland's second um, black lawyer, had formed a partnership with Frank Sikora, a white Clevelander of bohemian descent. And over the next quarter of a century, other black and white Cleveland lawyers would establish interracial practices. The nature of those practices are sometimes pretty obscure. Sometimes they amounted to little more than sharing office space and occasionally working together in particular cases. Sometimes they were more formal. Um, Wilson, for instance, um, subsequently entered into a partnership with another white lawyer in town, um, and then with the lawyer's sister. They got married. Um, in this and a number of other ways, the Cleveland Bar was open to African Americans seeking a legal career and presented them with opportunities that were roughly equivalent to those available to white would-be lawyers. Now, I, I don't want to exaggerate. Um, this is also a period where um, the, an elite corporate bar was emerging in Cleveland, much as it was in other American cities. Um, and that bar was closed um, to most Cleveland lawyers, black and white. Uh, but put simply, the Cleveland bar at what we used to call the turn of the century um, was, if minimally populated with African American lawyers, it was also integrated. By 1930, however, while the number of black lawyers had increased significantly, African Americans who aspired to a legal career in Cleveland faced different and often a narrower array of choices and opportunities. I want to look at how and why this landscape changed and at the impact these changes had on the professional lives of black lawyers in Cleveland. So what do I mean by, by integrated? Um, how many of you are um, uh, Western Reserve or Case Western Reserve alum, show of hands? Thank you. Um, so I, I want to introduce you to some of your um, fellow alumni. Um, this is the first entering class at Case West, at Western Reserve um, School of Law. Um, and uh, you'll notice that in the back row of students is an African-American student, a person named Samuel Wallace Hansberry. He had been a barber in, um, uh, he had owned a shop with his brothers, decided um, to try his hand at law. 
Um, and there he, he is in the uh, first class at, at Western Reserve. Indeed, in three of the first four classes at Western Reserve, there, were, there was an African-American student. Um, Western Reserve is, a, is created, uh, the law school was created in the 1890s. Um, it's followed in the early 20th century. I'm not going to leave you out. Cleveland Marshall alum, I don't have a good picture for you. I apologize. Um, but uh, the... The role that those two schools play is um, incredibly important uh, in terms of creating opportunities um, for uh, aspiring lawyers uh, to pursue their dream, um, including African-American lawyers. Um, because they're created as part-time programs, uh, they provided a low-cost alternative to Western Reserve or other, or other Midwestern uh, full-time law schools um, and gave people the opportunity to pursue a legal education while having a chance to um, work um, as they went to school. Um, and they, too, opened their doors to all comers, including um, African-American applicants. Um, the bar exam, while uh, an annoyance, um, did not prove to be a major impediment um, to uh, African-American students who wanted to become lawyers. I cannot confirm this story. Um, the second African-American um, graduate of uh, Western Reserve is a person named Alexander Martin. What I can confirm is in um, a choice that will make um, many of you wonder about his judgment and sanity. Uh, because one didn't have to complete law school back then to become a lawyer, at the end of his second year of law school, he took and passed the Ohio bar and indeed entered into a practice um, with John Anderson, uh, another African-American graduate of Western Reserve from um, that year before Martin, um, and then went back to law school and completed his third year of law school. Um, that's the sort of dedication we like in our students. Um, the story that I cannot confirm is just to show that supposedly just to show them that he could. He wrote his answers to the bar exam in Latin. Um, I don't recommend that as a strategy today, but um, that's that is the um, that is the folklore at least. Um, Lawyers were active together. Um, the institutions of the bar, the formal institutions of the bar, were not closed to African-American lawyers. Uh, some of you may know the history of the Cleveland Bar Association very well. The Bar Association is founded in 1873. Leon Wilson is not at the founding meeting of the Bar Association, um, but later that year, uh, Leon Wilson, the black lawyer who um, uh, entered into a couple of partnerships with white lawyers. Later that year, he joins the Cleveland Bar Association. Um, there were several, as I, as I said, there were several interracial law practices um, during this period. Um, The bar was integrated in a couple of other very important respects. Um, one of the things that I did for purposes of my research um, I was to throw myself in a black, into a black hole that I thought I would never come out of, which was to go um, through the um, common pleas dockets uh, to try to figure out what did these people do for a living? What kinds of work did they do? Um, uh, and with the help 
I should say, of uh, a legion of wonderful research assistants. Um, I have looked at the Court of Common Pleas dockets for the years 1900 to 1907 and also 1920 to 1926. Um, going through the Common Pleas dockets from 1900 to 1907, I, we were able to identify 296 cases uh, involving African American attorneys. Um, and uh, since there were some repeat players as clients, um, 255 clients. What sort of work did these lawyers do? It was quite varied. And um, to be sure, obviously, the common pleas court's records represent only one piece of the day-to-day -day work of these lawyers. It's the available piece. I actually did look at justice of the peace dockets as well, but um, found very little in them. Uh, the municipal court records were long ago destroyed. Thank God. Um, what sort of work did these, these lawyers do? About a quarter of it was matrimonial. About 20% of it was criminal defense work. Um, and the rest ran the gamut of civil litigation, representing both clients and typically small corporations, um, occasionally black-owned businesses, but other businesses as well. Um, Using the, uh, a variety of sources, but uh, primarily um, census records, um, I was able to identify the race of 116 of these 255 clients with a reasonable degree of certainty. So that's about 45% of the pool. Um, and what I learned, and I, I went down this pathway because as I started looking at the docket books, what I found was a lot of um, obviously ethnic, um, European uh, surnames for these clients. What I found was um, of the clients whose race I could identify, 79% um, were white. These are clients of African-American lawyers. 20% um, were African-American and one person uh, of mixed race. Um, judges appointed uh, black lawyers to represent white criminal defendants. In murder cases, the practice appears to have been to appoint two, a team of two lawyers. Judges were not averse to appointing an interracial team of lawyers. John Green, in fact, had developed um, a pretty good reputation as a criminal defense lawyer and shows up in some of those cases. In one other important sense, the bar of the early 20th century in Cleveland was integrated. If, say, in 1909, you wanted to find Cleveland's African-American lawyers, you didn't have to take a very long walk to visit all of them. They were all downtown in the professional and business district, mostly around public square. Um, so for instance, if you wanted to, that's where they were, uh, the purple marks. If you wanted to find um, Charles Chestnut, uh, most famously, incidentally, an author, but um, he also he also um, did practice law. Um, or Harry Davis, both African American lawyers. Um, you would have found them in the Williamson Building on Public Square, where you also would have found um, Calfee and Fogg and Smith, predecessor of the Calfee firm, and Taft and Arter, predecessor of Arter and Haddon. Um, if you wanted to find Edwin Dungill or John Green's children came into his practice uh, came into the practice eventually, the firm Green, Green and Green, um, you would have gone to the American Trust Building. It's the red building that no longer exists. Um, 
uh, near the Old Stone Church uh, on Public Square, where you also would have found, um, oh, actually, where you also would have found Alexander Martin, and you would have found um, the corporate firm Griswold and White. Um, I have some other pretty pictures of buildings where African-American lawyers at some point in the early part of the 20th century worked, the Engineers Building, the beautiful Blackstone Building, um, the Cuyahoga Building, the Erie Building, Superior Union Trust, and the Prospect and Fourth Building. Um, I don't, again, want to exaggerate. Cleveland was not um, the beloved community. Um, uh, two of my lawyers, Harry Davis and Charles Sutton, developed uh, reputations uh, as skillful litigators in civil rights cases. Um, why did they develop that reputa those reputations? Because they had ample opportunity to sue under Ohio's quite progressive, uh, but often defied, uh, public accommodations law. Um, Charles Chestnut's children could not get out of Cleveland soon enough, they tell us, um, because they found the atmosphere stifling. Um, nevertheless, there were reasons why Cleveland was um, unusually open, um, not unique altogether. Um, Carter Woodson, the father of African American history, um, did a study of black professionals and found other instances of black lawyers in um, northern cities during this period um, having significant white client bases, for instance. Um, I'm not sure he found any instances of interracial law practices. Um, but Cleveland, along with Boston during this period, um, were regarded as the most racially progressive cities in the United States. And that's not altogether surprising either. Um, they both had strong abolitionist and uh, radical reconstructionist um, traditions. Um, the ruling elite of Cleveland in the uh, late 19th and into the early years of the 20th century um, still had memories of those battles, still had commitments um, to those concerns. Um, and we see in other aspects of Cleveland life uh, a kind of openness that may be surprising um, to, to some of you, um, especially perhaps those of you who have grown up in Cleveland. Um, the churches were widely integrated. Uh, most unions did not exclude African American members, something that was not necessarily true. Um, nationwide. Indeed, John Green had a particularly close relationship to um, uh, labor and to unions, in part because he was, as those trains of fame used to, as he's on the trains of fame, which I guess the RTA has retired. Um, he is the father of Labor Day. Um, and I uh, counted at least one union amongst his clients. Uh, black, there were opportunities for black entrepreneurship in Cleveland, small businesses including the barbershops in most of the downtown hotels. Writing in 1915, uh, African-American journalist Robert Drake surveyed the condition of Cleveland blacks and wrote that he could not imagine a better place to live. But even as he wrote, the world that he described was changing. Um, now, I want to say a little something about, because my story is partly a story about geography, so I want to say just a little bit about why office location, why I, this focus on office location. Um, 
Office location mattered for both practical and symbolic reasons. One of the mysteries of the legal profession is the question of how clients and lawyers find each other. Um, and in trying to answer that question, uh, we're really relegated to occasional accounts in lawyers' memoirs and to a lot of speculation. There's reason to think, for instance, that would-be clients sometimes turn to lawyers who were fellow members of fraternal organizations or churches. Um, ministers, physicians, and funeral directors may have played a role in steering people to lawyers in moments where um, legal um, need was, um, uh, was present. Um, some of you may be familiar with the work of um, Ezra Brudno, a Cleveland lawyer and also novelist. Um, he describes in a 1920 novel, The Jugglers, a network of runners uh, of, for, uh, who worked for uh, personal injury lawyers who were dispatched at the first word of an industrial accident um, to sign up um, clients. Uh, so there are a variety of ways in which lawyers and, um, and clients came together. Advertisements, incidentally, seem not to have been uh, to have played a major role. In part, the bar ultimately regulates the use of advertisements, but also um, they were rare. I mean, you can find them in newspapers during this period, but there, it's not a method that seems to have been used frequently. Um, given the competition for clients and limited number of ways that a lawyer could promote himself, Presence in the downtown office buildings was significant beyond the easy access that it provided both to the bar library and to the courts. These buildings were where people went to find lawyers, whether they were looking for someone in particular or for a generic lawyer. They were also the place where lawyers came to know each other and developed referral networks. One can easily imagine that some clients who came to the American Trust Building or the Williamson Building seeking to employ one lawyer found themselves referred by that lawyer to someone else down the hall, the African-American lawyer down the hall, because the first lawyer was either overwhelmed by his caseload or didn't do the sort of work that the client needed. Presence downtown in and around Public Square was important for a second reading or a reason. Um, J.L. Chestnut, not to be confused with Charles Chestnut, um, uh, was the first African American lawyer in Selma, Alabama, and um, has written a wonderful book that I recommend, um, uh, Black in Selma. Uh, his biography. Um, Chestnut describes coming, he comes up to Howard University to be educated. He goes back to um, Selma with the goal of um, smashing um, segregation and the system of white supremacy. Um, and he shows up in Selma and he describes being perplexed about where he's supposed to sit in the courthouse. The courthouse was informally but rigidly segregated. The custom of the attorneys was to sit inside the rail in the section reserved for lawyers and their clients, apart from the mere spectators. But Chestnut didn't know if he would be allowed to violate segregation taboos. If he was allowed to cross that line, so he would sit in the African-American section of the courtroom with his client until his case was called, until one day when a uh, veteran Alabama African-American lawyer, Peter Hall, who was also a, um, shall we say, uh, Peter Hall didn't take anything from anybody, um, came to Selma to try a case and confidently sat himself down inside the rail and as close to the jury box as possible. And Chestnut, having seen that, 
concluded, okay, that's where I belong. Um, recalling the event, Chestnut writes that this was not simply a matter of prestige to be had by sitting with the white lawyers. Rather, it was an issue of self-definition as someone worthy of the designation lawyer. He writes, it was a matter of being where the lawyers were. Now, lacking a system of state-imposed segregation, the issue of where lawyer, black lawyers could be found was not as pointed in Cleveland. Nevertheless, their presence in the downtown office building signaled to skeptical lawyers, potential clients, and Clevelanders of all sorts, whether black or white, that these men were also worthy members of the bar. Okay. Did I tell you this was going to be a happy story? No, right? From the title, there's a suggestion that, that it isn't. Um, so even in 1915, as Charles Drake is describing Cleveland as he can't think of a better place for African Americans, um, the world is changing. Now, the world writ large is changing, uh, but Cleveland is as well. Um, Cleveland is changing in one dramatic way. It is expanding enormously. Yeah, I am sorry. I've got another table which is probably going to present the same problems. Um, uh, from 1900 to, to 1930, uh, Cleveland's total population uh, more than doubles. Its African-American population grows fourfold, largely because of the impact of the Great Migration, um, leading to um, um, many, um, in Cleveland's case, largely Alabamans uh, coming up um, to Cleveland, escaping the South and coming up to, to Cleveland. Um, That's actually a little more readable. I don't know why the, the multicolor. Um, so I looked again at the client base uh, at the docket books for the 1920s as a, as a comparison. Um, what's going on um, uh, in the lives, the professional lives of African American lawyers? Um, and I, a number of caveats that I won't, I won't go into the details, but there's, there are changes in record keeping. Um, there's also a, a major overhaul of the Cleveland court system, um, the creation of the, uh, the municipal courts as we know them, um, elimination of the justice of the peace courts. Um, so com direct comparisons are difficult. I mean, the most notably, for some reason, sometime before 1920, the common pleas clerks decided they would stop listing the name of the lawyer in criminal cases, which made it very hard to identify uh, what I think was probably a significant part of the docket of um, some of my some of my lawyers, some of whom had developed significant reputations as criminal defense lawyers. Um, but what do we see? We see um, that for those, I, I, I was I able to identify 1,188 civil cases in common pleas uh, between 1920 and 1926 involving African American lawyers. Again, there are occasional repeat clients, so there were 1,155 clients. Of those uh, with a uh, high level of confidence, I was able to identify the race of 362 of those clients. And we see that the client base is shifting significantly. So that now 35% um, a minority of the clients are white, 56% are African American, and 9% are identified as being of mixed race. Now, this actually overstates how integrated the client base was. Of the 125 
representations of white clients, 41 of those were in 1920. Only 20 of those were in the combined years 1925 to 1926. Why is this happening? It's happening, I think, for a number of reasons. It's happening in part because Cleveland, like the nation, is becoming more entrenched in notions of white supremacy. Um, there's a long story there. We don't have time for that. Um, but those commitments to Reconstruction, which were commitments both in the North and the South, the commitments to racial justice, that generation has disappeared. Um, So-called scientific racism is deeply entrenched in the universities and in American consciousness and policymaking. Um, and that's clearly part of what is happening. Um, but I think there is more to the story than that. Um, and again, I, you see, I have become enamored of maps and of geography and of um, geographical stories. And I think that's particularly appropriate in when we look at race in America. Because as... Um, David Delaney has argued in his book, Race, Place, and the Law, contests over space, over geography, have been central in the history of race relations in this country. And control over space as a mechanism of racial control has been a big part of that story. What do I mean by that? Well, if you think about... Um, uh, the legal issues about race, they are often about controlling where uh, minorities can go. Um, slave patrols, obviously, the recapture of fugitive slaves. Uh, emigrant agent laws, what were those? Those were laws that restricted the ability of people who coming down from the north to the south, this is um, uh, during Reconstruction and um, post-Reconstruction, to enlist laborers uh, for jobs in the north, well, the south wanted to control that because they wanted a captive labor, captive and very exploitable labor force. Um, so prohibitions, again, on the movement of African Americans. Residential segregation, obviously, school segregation. Um, during the early decades, the first three decades of the 20th century in Cleveland, we see a reconfiguration of the space in Cleveland, the geography of Cleveland. Prior to that time, there was no um, pocket, uh, significant pocket of African American um, residents in Cleveland. The city was uh, residentially much more integrated. It is during this period and really during the 1920s um, that we begin to see, um, that incidentally is Norman Minor. I had something to say about Norman Minor, maybe, maybe later in questions. And I wish I had more time. Uh, because it is because of Norman Minor um, that I got into this project in the first place. Um, that is my attempt to render um, the emergence of, uh, of a ghetto within Cleveland um, east of Public Square by about three miles. Um, and that is occurring in the 1920s. Um, so you recall, I asked the question, where do you go to find black lawyers in Cleveland in 1909? In 1909, there are only nine of them. Now there are more. But where do you go to find African-American lawyers? Um, and I said, you go downtown to Public Square and the areas around Public Square. Well, where do you go in 1929 to find African-American lawyers? There remains a presence downtown. Cleveland is not is unlike some other 
uh, American cities. Philadelphia, there were no black lawyers downtown until the 1950s. Um, there remains a presence, and specifically the lawyers who were already there, um, with one important exception. Um, the lawyers who were already there stay downtown, although in many instances they're sort of moved more to the periphery. Um, they're finding it more difficult um, to rent office space um, in the downtown uh, buildings. Um, black lawyers continued to establish practices downtown in the first years of the 1920s. That may partly have been due to a big building boom, which meant that there was a lot of um, um, office space capacity um, and a need to rent. <coughs> Excuse me. But after 1923, no newly admitted African American lawyer opens an office downtown. Instead, the new lawyers can be found in the emerging ghetto. Of 37 lawyers, only t in 1929, only 10 um, could be found downtown. Instead, um, I don't know how well that shows up, but um, uh, the, this is uh, mostly central and, um, and East 55th Street, uh, where you find um, uh, law offices of African American lawyers. Um, and I don't have pictures of those law offices. What I have in uh, that's Thomas Fleming. I will try to say something about him, too. He is the one lawyer who leaves um, downtown um, to establish himself in the black community, and that may have a lot to do, in his case, both with ideology and political ambition. He's the first African-American city councilman. Um, so what I have are blocks, pictures of the block, 4600 um, Central Ave, um, 5900 Central Ave. This one kills me because the other side of that driveway was a law office in which a number of significant African-American lawyers practiced, but unfortunately the photographer took the, the wrong picture. Um, so what's happening, um, I think what's happening is that as Cleveland becomes two cities, one black, one white, um, African American lawyers for the most part become invisible. Um, indeed, um, it would have taken some effort for most white Clevelanders to find these lawyers if they chose to do so. Um, I've looked at um, the various, um, um, you know, um, uh, the, R uh, the predecessors to the RTA roots, and for the most part, they skirted the black community. I mean, there's one line that goes down Central Ave, um, and that one had very minimal, a minimal number of stops uh, in order to discourage black ridership. Um, Invisibility matters here. Of the 125 white clients who engaged black lawyers during the early and mid-1920s, all but 13 hired a downtown lawyer. And of those 13, most of them hired Thomas Fleming, who as Cleveland's first and at the time only black city councilman did not suffer from the same invisibility within white Cleveland as did his colleagues. The creation of two Clevelands, one black and one white, did much to circumscribe the professional landscape for black lawyers. Needless to say, the story doesn't end there. Um, energy, creativity, tenacity, hard work, the desire to get ahead on the part of some of Cleveland's newer black lawyers led to successful careers in law and in other endeavors. People adapt to the constraints that they are faced with. Um, while these lawyers, I mean, I've been asked when I've presented this, is this a happy story or a sad story or a happy story? And, uh, you know, the question at first sounds 
odd, perhaps, because this is a story about circumscribed opportunities. Um, but there is a happy part of the story, which is that this was an opportunity for African American lawyers to establish themselves within the black community to, in many instances, establish, um, you know, launch political careers. And also it meant um, that th there were lawyers providing quality legal services to the black community who could be found um, within the black community. So it's a complicated story. Um, nevertheless, it's troubling that choices get circumscribed. It's one thing to make the choice that Thomas Fleming did. Uh, I mean, there's a, some of you may be aware of the, the debate within the African-American community about uh, an integrationist um, approach or building uh, strong institutions within the black community. This is typically described as the Du Bois versus Booker T. Washington debate. Um, Fleming was committed to Booker T. Washington's notions that um, you build within the African American community. It's one thing, however, to choose that. It's another thing to, to be restrained in such a way that that's your only choice. By the 1930s, um, African American lawyers are litigating to be able to get into the office buildings downtown and losing those cases. Um, all right. Um, so, something about today and the future, and then I want to leave a little bit of time for your questions. Um, so uh, what's the, I mean, this is a story of lost opportunities. This is a story of um, great possibilities um, of a Cleveland that was far more open, um, uh, certainly not without its, its bigotry and prejudice, but this was, uh, you know, much could have happened um, that doesn't happen, and then it, uh, you know, sets us back, and we are still trying to regain that ground. Um, obviously, the world is different now, and we have to some extent. Um, but you also know all of the depressing data about minorities in the profession. Um, and I won't go through that now in the interest of time, and because you probably are aware of it, I can refer you, however. Um, the ABA uh, periodically produces a report called Miles to Go about um, um, uh, minorities in the legal profession. Uh, I think the most recent one is 2005. Um, and I, I recommend that to you. Um, it will give you all of the data, and the data essentially says that um, minorities, including African Americans, are significantly underrepresented in the profession. The, I also recommend to you um, the work of David Wilkins, a Harvard Law professor who has is done uh, important and very interesting work on African American corporate lawyers and the challenges um, that African American corporate lawyers face. Um, he has, for those of you who are um, law firm lawyers um, in large firms, um, he has, I think, some important uh, recommendations to make um, about how to make um, diversity actually happen within the profession. Now, um, I want to talk instead about um, current challenges and some of my worries about the future, and I want to try to do that quickly and then leave you some time. Um, part of what I hope you gather from the story I told, yes, there are people of bad faith and bad intentions. Um, there were bigots, there were racists. I mean, we can tell the stories about 
Um, while Cleveland was relatively mild in terms as compared to Chicago, for instance, where um, bombings uh, were a um, common reaction to attempts to integrate communities, um, Cleveland was not without its own uh, violence and um, nastiness. Um, but my story isn't, isn't really a story of bad actors as much as it is neglect and indifference. These things didn't happen because somebody got together and said, oh, let's make sure all the African Americans live in a single community, although racial covenants did have a role to play in that. But other things had a role to play in that as well. Uh, let's make sure that African American lawyers become invisible. Um, there is a legend in Cleveland, uh, which I challenge anybody. I mean, I would love somebody, if you know uh, something about this, about the creation of the Cuyahoga County Bar Association, that it was created because the Cleveland Bar Association was closed to African American lawyers. That's not true. I mean, African American lawyers played uh, a role in the Cleveland Bar Association. Um, you know, unlike some cities like Chicago, where all of the bar associations except the National Lawyers Guild were closed to African American lawyers. Um, to be sure, the Cleveland Bar Association during this period really was the bar association of elite lawyers. I mean, they were the people who played the, the greatest leadership roles, uh, but African American lawyers were welcomed and played leadership roles, just not at the, the very top of the executive committee. Um, and I think today, again, we face challenges where it's not a matter of bad motive, bad intention, um, but things aren't going well. Um, things aren't going well in terms of the pool of African American applicants to law schools are shrink. Well, to, you know, this year the pool of all applicants to law schools uh, are shrinking. But this has been a problem in terms of attracting African American applicants for a while now, um, and other, uh, in some instances, minority um, applicants. And this is despite. Um, pipe, the, the ABA has been aggressive about pipeline efforts. Uh, the Cleveland law schools have been terrific about pipeline efforts, and I assume that that's true of law schools all sorts of other places as well. Um, why is this going on? I think it's going on for a number of reasons. Um, and I think if we're not careful, it's going to get worse. So, I mean, one thing, uh, the war on drugs is, in fact, also a war on African-American males. Um, we as a society have decided to, to invest far greater resources into putting uh, young black men in prison than in college. Um, that shrinks the applicant pool. Um, but other things are going on within the law schools. Um, um, emphasis on U.S. news rankings, um, something that no law school seems able to escape, um, creates a variety of pressures, some of them obvious, some of them a little bit less obvious. Um, rising tuitions. There, we, the law schools are actually incentivized to increase tuition because we get rewarded for spending more money. And how do we get money? We raise tuition. Um, that closes the door to law school to an increasing number of students. Um, our choices about how to allocate resources. Um, we spend money to buy the best credentialed students we possibly can get. I don't know that you can find a law school in this country that still does, I, there may be some, that still do need-based uh, financial aid instead of trying to buy the best students that we can possibly get. That means money isn't going to other people who may not have access to law school. Well, for the moment, that makes law school daunting, but not impossible, perhaps, because the federal government has generously gotten into the business of financing 
um, law school loans. But if my um, colleague Cassandra Robertson is right in her prediction that the federal government is going to give up on that rather soon as they realize that what they've invested in is a bubble, um, the whole edifice is going to come crashing down. And that's going to slam the door of law school in the faces of all sorts of people um, and disproportionately minorities. All right, I promised you some time for, for questions. And um, there are microphone tenders, and uh, please wait till they get to you, if there is anyone with a question. Comments, brickbats. Um, yeah. Oh, I don't need a mic. Uh, one of my personal observations when I was in law school, uh, which goes back a few decades, is that among the, the large firms, uh, even medium-sized firms, the downtown firms, uh, either explicitly or implicitly had a very clear um, segregated concept uh, I remember when I was in law school that I was told blacks don't apply here, Jews don't apply there. Uh, there was a permeation. Um, and it wasn't until some years later. Um, I, I remember when uh, the first African Americans started becoming partners in the so-called Big Five, at least Big Five when I started law school. Um, yeah, I mean, and this is a, I mean, this is a story that's true not just of, of Cleveland. Um, the elite bar was uh, slow to, I mean, the big firms were slow to open their doors, to open their doors not all, I mean, there is a reason why Cleveland, like any number of other cities, um, uh, have, um, you know, tr traditional Jewish and Catholic and sometimes Jewish and Catholic law firms. Um, the doors were not just closed to African American and black law firms. Um, the doors were not just closed to African Americans. They were closed to a variety of people. Um, when you look at how um, these firms begin to desegregate, um, in so many senses, um, you know, we're, we're the first Jewish partners, so oh, they're the ones in tax. Uh, the first women are in um, trust and estates. There is a kind of job category segregation. Um, I, I mean, the Cleveland Bar, I mean, has a very like any other, I suppose, complicated uh, history. It has its terrific moments, like um, during the Little Smith Act prosecutions of communists. You may, you probably know the story. Um, when lawyers were going to jail for defending communists in, in, the, Chris, in the Smith Act prosecutions, um, and the U.S. attorney in Cleveland uh, made all sorts of noise about how unpatriotic it would be to defend these folks. The big law firms, Jones Day, said we're going to, you know, they're entitled to a defense. We're going to defend them. Um, but uh, throwing open the doors to all sorts of talented people, that came slowly. Um, and for a variety of reasons, the law firms are still struggling. And here again, I, I recommend to you uh, David Wilkins's work because I think he's very insightful about some of the, uh, s some of the hurdles that um, minority lawyers face in this kind of tournament of lawyers for partnership within, within their firms. Um, and again, these aren't, these aren't matters of kind of conscious bigotry. The matters of indifference or lack of thought about how do we really make this work? 
Yes. Uh, please, somebody get a microphone. Oh. Well, the city club thinks otherwise. And I, I can't argue with the city club. Is there a, uh, are you aware of an organized uh, movement among the law schools to um, push back against the uh, sort of insidious implications of, of chasing the U.S. news? Uh, you describe these observations as if they're laws of physics, and it doesn't necessarily right. have to be. And I'm curious as to what's going on at the leadership Well, level. it's an I – and mean, I have a, a story to tell, I guess. Um, one of the law school's reaction to U.S. news has typically been rather than to try to push back. Yes, deans write letters saying this is all bogus, criticizing the um, – the, the formula that, that U.S. News uses, pointing out that this uh, gives us incentives to engage in, in a variety of, um, I mean, you, you've heard about some of the bad behavior of just lying about um, statistics. Um, but uh, typically what law schools have done have been to try to game the system. And to, to do that, I think, because they realize it's not exactly law of physics, but I think in a, in a battle with U.S. news, we lose. Um, I, a former colleague of mine I, suggested, I think only half-jokingly, uh, because one of the things law schools discovered was if you created a part-time program, those people, the U.S. news corrected their formula, those people were off the books. And therefore, suddenly part-time programs in schools, unlike schools that had traditional part-time programs for historic and important reasons, but schools that had had no interest in that suddenly start uh, creating part-time student uh, programs and forcing all the low-credentialed students into the part-time program so that they can jack up their, their statistics. Well, this colleague suggested that we create this, bo you know, essentially bogus one-semester part-time program and uh, put the bottom 92% of the class in that program uh, so that we skyrocket in U.S. News and then publish something saying, this is how we jerked U.S. News's chain. Um, the theory being that this would explode U.S. news and destroy it. Um, and we, the, the maybe um, more risk-averse um, amongst us, concluded we wouldn't win that. The next year, U.S. news would change its formula so that one of the critical factors would be longitude and latitude. And... You know, it would be precisely, you got negative 50 points if you were at this particular longitude and latitude. Um, it's depressing. I mean, you know, one hopes that over time, um, better, I, I students crave rankings. One hopes that at better time, uh, in the future, perhaps more uh, sensitive rankings that, that value the right things might push out U.S. news, but um, I don't see it right now. Yes? Uh, ah. the, the implication of your research is that, that Cleveland was different in the early part of the 20th century, but then we sort of went along with the national trends starting around 1920. Was, was there something, any, any precipitating incidents or, or things that you found that, that Cause that, or do we just sort of just went with the negative flow? I think we, I think we went with the negative flow. I mean, I think the population. I mean, I didn't talk much about the population figures. Um, I think the demographics matter, in the sense that um, the city is expanding. I mean, it's going to. The city is naturally going to change as it grows at this at this rapid rate. Um, and it's going to change in all sorts of ways. You can't have all the lawyers downtown at that point. And you can't have sort of everybody being able to find everybody. Um, that's not by design. That's just, you know, the explosion of the city. Um, uh, Cleveland politics do get uglier um, in the sense that 
Uh, there had been an old guard who had grown up within this movement of abolitionism and radical reconstruction and had some real commitment. It may have been partly uh, political, uh, you know, po political calculation, but had some real commitment. Um, but no, there's no incident. I mean, Cleveland, for instance, there are these awful race riots. Um, uh, shortly after World War I. I mean, the black community <coughs> in Chicago is attacked. The, the, the neighborhood is, a uh, significant part of the neighborhood is burnt down. Um, East St. Louis, the same thing happens. Um, Cleveland escapes that. Um, it's all, not all sweetness and light by any means. And by, by the 1920s, Charles Chestnut is complaining, do I have to litigate every time I want to go into a downtown restaurant to get a cup of coffee? Um, but, uh, but no, there's no, there's, there's no single moment. Yeah. All right, thank you very, very much for coming. <laughs>